live. Good. If I don't have, if I have a problem, I'll come see you. If not, then we're good. You're hard. You're hard to do speak. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I need to see you. I got something to give you. I want you to try and see how, what you think of it. So the idea came from you in an indirect fashion. Silverstein, Becky Silverstein, if you could come up to the front, please. Folks, we're going to be starting in just a minute.
start to take our seats, please? If we don't, John Criolo is going to be very upset. He accuses us if we're a few minutes late of being on Hawaii time. <laughs> Not quite that bad. Find yourselves a seat, folks. Thanks. Do me a favor. Before we begin tonight's opening ceremonies, take your electronic devices and pretend like you're in church. <laughs> emergency surgery somewhere and you have to, you know, the office is calling and all that other stuff. But do me a favor and, and please, please, put them on silent or turn them off. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know me yet, <laughs> My name is Ken Thomas. I'm the immediate past president of the Florida Federation of Chapters, also known as NARF Florida. I would like to welcome you to the 33rd Biennial Convention of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. We're going to start off with a Hawaiian prayer by John Criolo of the Hawaii Federation. Thank you, Ken. The invocation consists of selected Hawaiian proverbs and political sayings, which I picked for their appropriateness to this occasion. For those of accusing me of saying the same thing over and over again, these are not the same prayers that I used two years ago, one year ago, or a couple of days ago. Honest, not that you'd ever know, but they're not the same. And I get them from a book written by Mary Kawena Pukui, which you can buy on Amazon.com, by the way. And it ends with the last verse of the Queen's Prayer, just because I like it. Written by Queen Lilio Kalani, the last reigning monarch of the Hawaiian Islands. Each saying is given in Hawaiian, followed by the literal English translation, and if necessary, the meaning. Uh, Ken already took my next line, which was to show respect for the occasion mobile phones and other electronic devices should be secured or placed on stun. That's, that's for all my Navy training. Mahalo. A puli kako. May we pray. Oka pono ke hana ia ahiho mainalani. Continue to do good until the heavens come down to you. In other words, blessings to those who persist in doing good. O ke alelo ke hoi uli o ka olelo a ka waha. The tongue is the steering paddle of the words uttered by the mouth. In other words, heed the tongue lest it speak words that offend. Ba'a ka waha. Hana Kalima, shut the mouth, keep the hands busy. Never mind the talking, start working. Ahoe loko maikai li nele ika panaai. No good deed has ever lacked its reward. A pupu kahi, be of one clump, be united in thought. Pupu kahi i holo mua, unite in order to progress. He iki ana ia a ka pono, it is recognizing of the right thing. 
one has seen the right thing to do and has done it. Nalaila e kahaku malalo o ko ehui ko makau malohia amalo no amene. And so, Lord, protect us beneath your wings and let peace be our portion now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Richard Carroll, uh, who is a district vice president with NAR Florida. Uh, he will conduct the presentation of the colors. Richard. Good afternoon. We're very happy to have with us today the honor guard from Lyman High School in Florida under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel Dan Clark. At this time, would you please stand for the, present the colors and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem.
There's a young man sitting up here in the stage <laughs> who we have come to know over the past few years, who I've had the pleasure of being in meetings with, as have the other officers within NARF, and who's quite a celebrity. One morning when I was uh, having my coffee and doing my second push-up of the day, <laughs> along comes the Today Show. And for about 10 minutes, I was watching this particular person, that they were doing a story on. And when he first came on, I immediately reached for the telephone after screaming for my wife, Arlette, you need to come and see this. And I started dialing this hotel's number. Now I can get probably through eh, maybe 10 push-ups in the morning. This gentleman does about 2,000. He is probably one of the fittest individuals that I know. But I would like to introduce the person who really is the host of this convention and who happens to be the proprietor of this particular hotel, who treats his staff so well that nobody ever wants to leave here, and who does more to giving back to this community than anyone else that I know of, Mr. Harris Rosen. First of all, I have to thank you so much for that extraordinary introduction uh, because you introduced me as a young man. <laughs> I stopped being young about 50 years ago, I suspect. First of all, I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome from the bottom of my heart. We are so, so excited that all of you are here with us. And our goal is to make sure that we exceed even your highest expectations. And we will work very hard to achieve that. I, I did want to just share with you a couple of things that um, we've done uh, since you were here last. Um, we have a new pub called Sam and Bubby's. Samuel Rosenhaus was my granddad from Austria. Bubby was my grandma, also from Austria, Hungary. They came here in the 1919, 1920 era. You will notice that the sign has um, a barrel and a bathtub, and I will share with you the significance of that. Bubby, I think I can tell the story now. <laughs> Bubby made vodka <laughs> in her bathtub. The Lower East Side of Manhattan in one of the settlement houses, and Sam put it in a barrel, he made barrels. That's Sam and Bubby's. Harry's is a new restaurant we opened up. Harry is named after my granddad, Harry Rosanowski, from Ukraine, and he came also in around the 19, 19, 1920 time frame. And he opened up a tiny little restaurant on Hester Street on the Lower East Side, and so in his name we have opened this little restaurant. We also have um, a beautiful little deli named Red's. My mom was a redhead, my dad called her Red, so we have Red's Deli. We also have Everglades Restaurant. A dear friend of mine started the Everglades Foundation, and he came over to see what we were doing in terms of the restaurant and was absolutely thrilled. And when I shared with him that a percentage of our revenues would be donated to save the Everglades, he was the happiest guy 
in the world. Uh, sadly, the night after we met, he was driving back to Tallahassee was killed. But we have Everglades for George Barley. We also have a new ballroom that we didn't have when you folks were here last, and we're so proud of that. So a lot of wonderful changes here at Rosen Center. I, I do want to share with you, and I won't take very long, um, a, a philosophy that after 40 years of having this little company has evolved. And the philosophy is based on something I refer to as responsible capitalism. Now, that's an oxymoron. There's nothing responsible about capitalism. But I was sitting at my desk about 25 years ago, and I did hear a voice. And the voice said, Harris, it's time for you to give back. From the Lower East Side of Manhattan, to Cornell University, to three and a half years with Uncle Sam in Asia and in Europe as a young officer. To where we are today, I said, thank you, God. Only in America is this possible. And so the voice was asking me to please give back. We created the Rosen Foundation. We adopted an underserved neighborhood where every two, three, and four-year-old goes to preschool at our expense. We mentor the children and their parents. High school graduation rates in this neighborhood have gone from 50% to 100%. These youngsters apply to an accepted a vocational school, community college, and four-year colleges here in Florida. Everything is paid for room books, travel, tuition, everything. We have sent from this neighborhood 250 youngsters to college. Something. <laughs> Something that heretofore would have been impossible. We created the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. Started with 100 students, today we have 3,500. The fastest growing college in the United States. We've spent 20 years in Haiti working on a multitude of projects of building a village and an industrial complex. We built a Jewish community center not far from here. We have a scholarship endowment program at the University of Central Florida. I'm telling you this because I have been blessed beyond anything I ever imagined and it's okay to work hard, and it's okay to make money, but it's not okay not to offer a help. <laughs> My dream, and I was in Atlanta not too long ago, and Dr. King's family was sitting there in the first row, and I turned to Bernice King and I said, may I have a dream also? And she said, of course. And my dream is that in every underserved neighborhood in the United States of America, there will be a program similar to the one we have in Tangelo Park, where every two, three, and four-year-old goes to preschool free, and where every youngster who's accepted a vocational school or college gets to college free also. That's my dream. And I've not made this announcement formally, but I'm gonna announce it here. In Central Florida, we have a, a neighborhood in downtown Orlando called the Paramore neighborhood. It's a tough neighborhood. But within the next 30 days, we're going to announce that we're gonna replicate in Paramore what we've done at Tangelo Park. So, try to convince a group of wealthy individuals, people who have received more than they probably deserve, <laughs> who, now, who now 
have an obligation to give back. And that's my goal for the rest of my life. So have a wonderful conference. God bless you all, and God bless America. Association, as well as a small gift. I know you probably have a trophy room about this size somewhere. <laughs> you could probably just put it on there. Thank you so much. The next person on our agenda is the mayor of Orlando, Buddy Dyer. Many of you don't know, but the uh, Orlando has two mayors, just like Chicago. <laughs> I can say that because that's where my wife is from, and that's where her family is from. That's where some of you are from. They've got the real mayor, and then they've got the one that's deceased, but who still runs the city. <laughs> the city of Orlando, though, actually does have two mayors. Uh, one actually is responsible for the county. Don't ask me how a county has a mayor. Usually cities do, but anyway. They have a county mayor, and they have a city mayor. Buddy Dyer is sort of an institution here in Orlando. He's one of these people who would come through the door dressed like Clarabelle the Clown, for those of you who remember Howdy Doody. And you'd never guess that he was actually the mayor, but he is, and he does a remarkable job in one of the most important cities in our state. So he was, unfortunately, he could not be in two places at once. And no, he is not out on the campaign trail raising money. But instead, he had some other business to take care of, so he sends his greetings. And let me read his greetings for you. On behalf of the city of Orlando, I would like to welcome you to the 33rd Biennial National Convention of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. While you are visiting Orlando, I encourage you to experience all the things that make Orlando one of the fastest growing, most business friendly, and quality of life centered cities in our nation. Underneath a skyline that has doubled in just the last five years, our dynamic, bustling downtown is alive with fine dining, exciting nightlife, fabulous shopping, year round outdoor activities arts and culture, professional sports, and abundant parks. Our vibrant and diverse culture is evidenced by the many distinctive neighborhoods that dot our city. I invite you to walk our red brick tree-lined streets, visit our beautiful historic districts, or our downtown arts district, and take in Orlando's crown jewel, Lake Eola Park. Again, welcome to Orlando. We are happy to have you here and hope you enjoy taking part in the wonderful experiences that can only be found here. Best wishes to all, and I wish you continued success. Sincerely, Buddy Dyer, the Mayor of Orlando.
like to ask Elaine Hughes to please come up and respond. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. So how excited are we to be in Orlando? Yes? So on behalf of all of us, I extend our many thanks to Mayor Buddy Dyer for his warm and gracious welcome letter as we kick off NARF's 33rd National Convention here in Orlando, our host city. We are pleased and absolutely delighted to be here. Orlando is truly a great city to conduct the business of NARF as well as have a little bit of fun. I am sure there will be many who will take advantage of the wonderful hospitality and the many attractions that Orlando offers to us. With a city slogan, The City Beautiful, and an unofficial slogan as the theme park of the world, Orlando certainly lives up to its great reputation. We look forward to a grand adventure here and taking advantage of all the this wonderful attractions that can only be found here in the great city of Orlando. Again, it is exciting to be here and best wishes to all for a productive and successful convention. And I also offer my personal welcome to all of you. Thank you. In order for this to be a convention, we have to have something that officially starts it off. Many of you have heard me talk about some of the th possible things that we could have had for Florida tonight. One of them was Dangerous Dan the Alligator Man. At the time when I presented this to the host committee, they thought that, you know, Ken, it's time for you to take a rest. <laughs> Dangerous Dan is actually someone who is in the area. He actually runs a fast food emporium. I'm not sure where he gets his food from, but I'm assuming that whatever the gators don't eat, he feeds to human beings. But Dangerous Dan, his, his trademark are snakes and gators. And he brings them to the site. Meaning that Dangerous Dan would be walking down the corridors here from the back door with a couple of snakes wrapped around his body and leading four alligators two of them about five feet long and another two about four feet long on leashes. Well, I figured that if we had that and somebody got nicked, this convention would be talked about for the next 25 years. Do you remember Orlando when Johnny Jones got nicked? Joe Ruskus, are you here? Luskus. Luskus. Joe Luskus, are you here? Please stand up. Uh, would you please uh, go immediately outside? Uh, your wife is being taken to the hospital. Go to the first aid office, I'm sorry. First aid office. First aid office. Salon number 12. Salon number 12 upstairs on the second floor. something that would be something that we could probably start the convention off by bringing the reptiles in here and parading them up here in the front. Photo opportunity available afterwards. And I figured 
you know, in, in uh, Sparks, we had a couple of uh, professional women <laughs> give Joe a sort of introduction to the nightlife there to open the convention. And I thought maybe a gator or two might, you know, get him moving again, get those stirrings going. But instead, we're going to give him the device that will give him control over us for the next, well, at least some of us, for the next few days as far as this convention is concerned. So, Mr. Bowdoin, I'd like to, to present to you the gavel signifying your control of the convention. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, Ken, and the NARF members here in Orlando for all the work you have done getting ready for this convention. We are looking forward to a wonderful week, and I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting one. We have a couple items that might be controversial that we may talk about during the next three, four days, but I know we're going to work together as a, one big family. We uh, have the pleasure tonight of having a couple of Congress people that will be addressing us. And I believe one is, have they here? Okay. They're on their way in. Oh, this sounds like Sparks again. We, we delayed for 20 minutes while that lady tried to find her way from the front door to here. <laughs> but, and then she gave a, a real interesting talk. But I, I, I'm sure, for those of you in Spock, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, um, while we're waiting, John's told me that uh, the congressperson is being walked over here right now. And while we're waiting, there are going to be some lunch and learns that you definitely want to attend. In fact, you should attend all of them if you can. But tomorrow, we're going to have a lunch and learn on the future of NARF. And you really should try to make that one because as you know, some of the resolutions that we are proposing or that have been submitted will reduce the national officers from four to two and the Foreign Committee has come up with a number of other items and recommendations. So try to make that lunch and learn tomorrow. I believe it's at 12.15 if I'm correct. And I believe the Congressman uh, just walked in. So I can stop trying to, trying to fill in the void. <laughs> As the former chairman of the House Civil Service Subcommittee, many of you may be familiar with our next speaker. Congressman John Micah is currently serving in his 11th term in Congress, serving what is now Florida's 7th district, and has held many committee and subcommittee leadership roles in his 22 years in Congress. He currently sits on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee and may even be our next committee chairman next year. Please join me in giving Congressman Micah a warm, not welcome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, federal employees. Uh, both current and also retired. Uh, thank you for your service and uh, your years of dedication to the American people and helping make our government uh, uh, work and uh, also assist those that we all represent. Welcome to Central Florida. My district is just a little bit to the north here. I think you're gonna hear from a couple of other members. We have a couple of 
Democrats, a couple of Republicans that represent the central uh, Florida area. Right now, my district is a little bit to the north. As you may have watched the news, there is some redistricting going on. Uh, but through the next two years, uh, the 7th Congressional District will remain pretty much the same. That's a, a topic for another discussion. Um, I wanted to tell you, first of all, you're safe for about another two weeks, then the Congress returns. Uh, I'm on a work release program. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to actually uh, have two functions here today. First, to greet you and welcome you. And you couldn't have gotten a warmer greeting than you got today. What was it, about 100 out there? <laughs> and is everyone, where, are you all from Florida? Everybody from Florida, raise your hand. Or from around, and around the country, raise your hand. Welcome, you from around the country, stay long, spend lots of money, make Florida green. Uh, we are delighted that you're here. And enjoy yourself. You worked hard, you deserve it. And you belong to a great organization which advocates for great people who have given great service to our nation. I, in my introduction, I thought maybe they forgot that I was chairman of, uh, of civil service. And it wasn't easy. I still am not sure if I liked Newt Gingrich. I was the first Republican chairman of civil service in 40 years, and no one knew what to expect. And I came to that position and I thought, what can I do in a positive fashion for our federal employees and our federal retirees? One of the first things coming from the private sector, I thought, well, in the private sector, I had insurance, term insurance, and I buy that insurance. And now I was in an uh, elected position and, oh, wow, I could just go out and get some life insurance. It should be pretty reasonable because we had, what, 1.9 million federal employees and 2 million retirees or in that neighborhood, you should be able to get a pretty good deal, too. But I found out that the life insurance hadn't been bid in 40 years. There weren't the uh, options to, to uh, give to our federal employees that the private sector, in fact, I got in trouble, because I, when I saw the rates, I, I pulled the rates out of the newspaper for term life insurance, and I sent them out. The Ethics Committee said I couldn't do that because I was showing what you could get on the private sector from private vendors. But I showed the comparison and forced them to give you some choices and federal employees and retirees, at least the choices and the lower prices that you can get on the, uh, from the private sector. And there's nothing wrong with giving good benefits at reasonable and competitive cost to those who've, who've uh, worked for uh, the federal government. Then, uh, you know... So this, uh, okay, so this wild Republican comes in with some other eyes and I think, well, you know, I might want to, uh, if, I, if I decide to get to life insurance, maybe I should look at some extended, you know, none of us are getting any younger, I should get some uh, extended uh, uh, insurance. Uh, uh, and uh, so I looked at the, uh, I looked at the options. You know what the options were, ladies and gentlemen? Zero, zip. The federal government had none. In fact, I initiated the legislation that eventually became law, and now we have the largest extended care, long-term care program for any group, you know, in the nation. Did you know that? And that's the beginning of what we did. So we can work together. We can get things done together. I don't want to tell you everything's peaches and cream. This has been a rough time for the country. It's been a rough time for federal employees. Let me tell you about me, for example. Okay, Micah, you're a member of Congress. What, do you, what have you done? You know what we've had to do? I have, have had to cut my uh, office expenses, our expenditures, by 21% the last three years. Now we just got, wow, we got a whopping 1% increase, right? Whopping 1%. So 20% uh, decrease in my expenditures in my office. The first time I've ever had in 20 years to let one employee go, I had to let one employee go. I chose someone without dependence, but I had to choose between people putting food on the table and people that worked loyally for me. Uh, so, so I've gone through a downsizing. I lost four, count them, four of my senior employees in this last round. 
You know, right up to the end, everyone thought they had to go on Obamacare, the, the, the new uh, health insurance program. And I had one uh, long service employee who had had five bypasses, a, a pacemaker stint, and some cancer. Didn't want to take a chance. I lost him and I lost three others. Almost 80 years of government service because they didn't want to change, one, their health care plan, and two, also cuts in retirement. What about, some of you, now, some of you may not know this, but I have, I have to, okay, the skeletons come out of the closet. I'm a Republican. Uh, the, <clears throat> some of you may have heard of another Micah who's a Democrat. Yes, my brother Dan was a Democrat member of Congress from South Florida from 1978 to 1988. We're the only two brothers since 1889 to serve in Congress from different political parties. Did you know that? <laughs> That's a good trivia question. My other brother Dave was an aide to the former U.S. Democrat uh, United States Senator and later Governor Lawton Childs. So I'm the only Republican in the family. My brother, uh, brothers are all Democrats. Everybody says, well, how come you're a Republican, they're Democrats? And I said, I'm the only one in the family that learned to read. <laughs> okay, all you Democrats. Now listen, I have to take it twice as much, it's told twice as much the other way, so. Uh, but, uh, but I do come from a very bipartisan, historic family, and we all learn to live together, grow up together, work together. Uh, now, I'm going on vacation with them at the end of this week now. Will we survive that one? But that's going to be fun. But again, uh, we do face some serious challenges. We face them in Congress. Now, let me tell you something uh, about the situation, and you know the situation. You're smart federal employees. You've been there. You've seen it. We're approaching $18 trillion in debt. You don't want to wake up one day and uh, we've tried to go to the bank, only be able to get so much out. You don't want to have them skimming your savings to, to meet paying the debts. The United States is a creditor just like an individual or any other uh, country in a global market. And you can only run yourself into so much debt and it will catch up with you. You want to be able to pay the benefits. You want to be able to pay the retirement, health care, and the other things that were promised. So we have to keep our eye on the ball. We've got to make certain we do a better job in responsibly paying our bills and balancing the federal budget. And again, all you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, leave here tonight. Go turn that TV on. You did it this morning. You see the world that we live in. It's a, in chaos. The only thing that guarantees you freedom and liberty and national defense is the United States federal government. Some of you have worked there and, and helped protect our borders. Some of you worked there and served our country. Uh, some of you have worked there and served our nation and our armed forces. But our national defense is our number one federal responsibility. You can, when you wake up tomorrow and you put your feet on the floor and you're in the United States of America, you are among the most blessed people who have ever walked the face of this earth. So we have some challenges, and you know, I've, I chaired the Transportation Committee. I'm the first chair, full committee chairman from this particular area. Uh, my predecessor, a Democrat, took him 32 years to become chairman, a Republican chairman before that, 28 years. And look how young I am. I'm just a, <laughs> but uh, uh, I found, uh, maybe it is my background, my family, my attitude. You can accomplish anything you want if you work together. And there are challenges, there are differences. Now, how many of you have been married? Raise your hands. Okay, okay. <laughs> then you know about those differences. This week, my wife celebrated 42 years that we haven't killed each other. <laughs> but uh, again, you learn to live with each other. You re realize the differences we have as individuals. and. The, and the most important thing is moving forward uh, together for the country. So I'm pleased to be with you. I looked at some, I look at your legislative goals. There's some I agree with that some we may disagree with. There's some we can accomplish, but we can, what we can do is specify the things that we can do together 
I've done it. I've had, uh, the, my Democrat predecessors couldn't pass a transportation bill very important to the country. 20 times they couldn't pass an F.A. bill. They controlled the House, the Senate, the White House. I passed every one of them. They passed the Coast Guard bill they hadn't been able to pass. Passed a pipeline safety bill. Henry Raxlin, one of the most liberal members of Congress, was one of the first to sign the conference report. So don't anyone tell me Republicans and Democrats can't work together for the benefit of the United States of America and the citizens we represent. <laughs> and finally, some of you may see me. I sometimes, if you don't behave as a federal employee, I go after you. We are trustees of the hardworking people who are sending their money to Washington to get the job done. They, nobody dis, should dislike government. Government does things that no one else can do and sometimes shouldn't be doing. But when they do the wrong thing, they have to be held accountable and will be held accountable in a responsible manner. Not a political manner, but a responsible manner. If they're spending money and it's wasteful, it's your money. You know, the guy in the hot tub who I disclosed that was spending lavish money on conferences, and I love people to come to conferences. You're going to spend a lot of money at this conference. It's great that you come here. It's great that federal employees go to conferences together and learn and work and uh, also have, have a good time together and renew their uh, sources to go back and do a better job. But when you're spending money uh, in an improper fashion, a little bit like pornography, it's hard to describe, but when you hear the, and see it, then you know exactly what it is. They need to be held accountable too, and I will hold them and anyone else who abuses their position. And many of you come to me, Mr. Micah, I worked in Social Security, Mr. Micah, I worked in Costa, Mr. Micah, I worked at another federal agency and I saw this waste and you've helped me help us do a better job for the American people. And I believe in, in uh, giving federal employees a lot of that responsibility. Turn over some of the operations to federal employees. They can do a better job. They can cut out the waste and the overhead and they, and they can get the job done for the American people. So I spoke longer than the time they gave me. I thought maybe one of my colleagues would show up. Are they here yet? They don't want to come and hear me either. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Now at great personal risk, I'll open the floor to any uh, oh, no. quick, friendly questions. Others will be <laughs> seized by the CIA. And <laughs> if you have any questions, we have four mics where the sergeant of arms are, those are the only mics that work. So <laughs> if you go to one of those Is mics, this okay? They had told me they might yeah, want me to yeah. answer some questions. We're going to have so, about 10 minutes. OK, a couple of minutes. And we're like friendly. It's too bad my mother's not alive. She'd be out there <laughs> asking a nice, friendly question. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. We can't hear you. Turn her mic on so far. I've got the off switch up here somewhere. Good. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It is a lady. I, don't know. I can't see. I cannot see you. So just. Okay, you should lay yeah. hand on the way in, and I'll shake okay, your yes, hand too. on the way out. Okay. But I just want to know if I can sign you up to be a NARC member. Yeah. <laughs> well, not if I have to lose the election to do that. <laughs> But uh, I'll probably join you, and I don't plan on staying uh, forever, but uh, some people like to get rid of me sooner rather than later. But uh, be glad to be a member at some point. And uh, I, can you join when you're still in? Yes. Yes. Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> Thank you. OK. I hope it's not too much. God, there goes more money. <laughs> I don't even join all the chambers of commerce because it's too expensive. Go ahead, you're dealing with it. Yes, good evening. Yes. Um, I am a federation president from the state of Kansas, and Welcome. I am a current federal employee. Mm -hmm. Okay, my suggestion is since you're talking about how federal employees know how best to save money, this whole thing about lose, use it or lose it, the budget has got to go. A government agency that is good at budgeting should not be 
um, get a slap on the hand and told that if you don't spend it, you don't need it for next year. Correct. Absolutely. This lady is correct. The other thing too, folks, now listen to this. Uh, more than half the members of Congress have been there for less than two terms. Not too long ago when we were trying to do the budget, um, I was sitting with one of my senior colleagues from Florida and everybody at the table was having lunch with us, a little brown bag lunch, were what I call junior members, they just got elected. None of them had been there when we had passed a budget. Think about that. The federal government did not pass a budget in five years. You know the turmoil that leaves your agency in. You can't run a government by continuing resolutions. You need to step up to the plate, pass legislation to make the government work, and, and uh, get the job done. Now, I got criticized for voting for the budget. I voted for the budget. I didn't want turmoil. I have 2,800 federal employees right out here in my district, the newer part of my district on the east side. And I, I don't want to go back to them and tell them that we don't have a budget, we don't have any stability. And, and cuts that would have taken place through sequestration, no one thought sequestration would, would take place. But arbitrary cuts would have devastated uh, a lot of our folks. So yes, we had to have a budget. Yes, we should have a budget. And yes, we should not uh, force agencies or put them in a position where money at the end of the, end of the fiscal year, uh, spend it, uh, move it, or lose it. That's wrong. Next. Go ahead. Virginia Camella, Chapter 817, D, delightful, D-Land, Florida, formerly in your district, uh, not currently. Where, where, D-Land? D-Land, yes. yeah. Yeah, I still love the edge. I might be coming closer after this redistricting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it looks like it was, yeah, yeah, you're going to be pick up Orange City. Half my chapter will be picked, are, in, are in your district. Um, and I'm also the District 3 Vice President of NAR, of NAR Florida, which includes Orlando, Seminole County, and Volusia County, which uh, coincides. I have eight, uh, seven other districts that are also in the district, uh, congressional districts. And what I want to ask you is, are you, will you be willing to meet with a committee of uh, NARF Oh, always. I, I, I love to uh, meet, speak, attend. Now, when we're in session, I can't oh, come down, but just, but, and I have an aide here, someone, the, the guy with the silk jacket on over here and the Gucci uh, shoes. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. He actually goes to UCF and he's uh, in some pretty, but be glad to get him the information. And we'll do it. Maybe we can do it in October when we're on our next work release program. <laughs> next. You got some over here? He looks like a friendly gentleman. Go right ahead. Number 10. 10. We're trying to push. Automated, incredible system. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you activate 10? Press the button. You guys paid a lot of money for this audio visual. I want, okay. I want some of that discounted for these folks. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Congressman, but I have to take very strong, strong exception to your comment about Obamacare. When Obamacare was instituted, its main intention was to help those without insurance. There was absolutely no reason that federal workers or congressmen had to be included in Obamacare. It was a stunt created by Senator Grassley, the master, I have to say, the master of the seat, who in front of his town hall meeting said, ladies and gentlemen, you better watch out because they're going to go after grandma and, and uh, let her go. That it's going to kill your grandma. But that's a sign. The fact is that, that when you were covered by group insurance or corporation insurance, that should never have been considered uh, for federal workers. They uh, didn't need to be included in Obamacare. So I don't okay. know why. All right, well, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, Mr. Grassley put it in. Uh, I happen to be a victim of that. 
I liked FVHBP. I tried to enhance FVHBP when I was chairman. I tried to extend some of the uh, health care benefits for TRICARE and others. I'm very sympathetic to people who do not have health care. My family did not have health care. My father died in a crowded veterans hospital. I left the University of Florida and my other brother who went on to be in Congress. Uh, he went and uh, cleaned urinals and, and uh, toilets and, and, and worked his way through school. It took us a long time because we didn't have health care. We had to go and help our family. So I know from, coming from a family what it means. And I want people to have health care. I want you to have health care you can afford and make it uh, more affordable for you. Now, we, uh, again, I take some differences on the subject. First of all, I also had family who didn't, who had pre-existing conditions. I've always favored that and we should do that and if we reform it again, it should be in there. I have no problem with extending it. I've had kids who haven't, have reached a certain age and didn't have coverage. So there are good parts to it. But the president himself has changed it some 30, 40 times uh, to what we did. And again, there are still millions of people who do not have health care who need to have health care. What we need to do is bring the cost down for everyone, including federal retirees and federal employees. And we can do that with some measures. Opening competition, a little bit on the liability and tort reform. So yes, there are some health care proposals that I can support. I chose to go on, um, on Obamacare. I was the victim of, uh, of what was there. I didn't have any choices if I ever wanted to do anything in retirement. And uh, I pay more, uh, my premiums are more, and my deductibles are three times as much. What's good, uh, he asked me why I voted for that, and I figured what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and I am the gander, and I'm on Obamacare. And uh, um, again, the, we passed, the Congress passed it. I did not vote it, but um, I'm on it. Yes. Uh, is there someone there? I think we're going to have to move on. Okay, we're going to have to move on. That's good, because that last guy was getting a little. <laughs> no, but you could, again, thank you so much, too, for raising these questions. Um, get to your representatives um, is my, my final uh, word and your representatives not need to know um, your concerns and that's the system there are flaws in the system but it's a great system it does I sometimes I'm amazed when I go there I see the diversity of people that are sent there as representatives but the founding father did an incredible job in creating a system that sometimes doesn't quite work and uh, sometimes it's very loud and sometimes it's very, uh, there's a lot of debate and discussion. But in the end, it's somehow between the Founding Fathers, the Constitution, and the Good Lord, He has put us in the right place. Now we need to do the right thing. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Now, uh, this is an inflatable Lexus. <laughs> Jesse, and the next one's not here, right? Okay. Okay, we're going to go on to the memorial service, Ken. We've changed the name a little bit. We're going to call this the celebration of life. Celebrating life is a phrase used to honor the life of a person that is no longer with us. A remembrance of one who has passed. Celebrating life helps us feel closer to our loved ones, to share how our loved one touched our lives, and learn how they turned and touched other people's lives as well. It's also an attitude. It's about being grateful. Grateful for what life has given us, the people who came into our lives and the people who have left our lives. All people we meet, 
leave an imprint on the fabric of our lives. Some things we have learned, one of those things is that the grand show is eternal. It is always sunrise somewhere, the dew is never all dried at once, a shower is forever failing and falling, vapor ever rising, eternal sunrises, eternal sunsets, eternal dawns on the seas, each in its own turn as the earth revolves. Each day too short for all the thoughts we want to think, all the walks we want to walk, all the books we want to read, and all those friends that we want to see. There is another sky, ever serene and fair. There is another sunshine, though it be darkness there, never mind faded forest, never mind silent fields. Here is a little forest where a leaf is ever green. Here is a brighter garden. Where not a frost has been, it is unfading. Unfading flowers, and I hear the bee hum. Come into my garden. Come into my garden, says our loved one. Come. I'd like to ask the Regional Vice President for Region 1, Mr. Arthur Pike, to please come forward to report on Region 1 member deaths since the 2012 National. The following are member deaths in Region 1 since the 2012 National Convention. Connecticut, 201. Massachusetts, 620. Maine, 128. New Hampshire, 90. New York, 1,080. Rhode Island, 147. Vermont, 27. Total member deaths in Region 1, 2,293. Region 2, Evelyn Kirby. Good afternoon. The following are member deaths in Region 2 since the 2012 National Convention. District of Columbia, 148. Delaware, 63. Maryland, 1,284. New Jersey, 714. Pennsylvania, 1,569. Total member deaths in Region 2, 3,000. 778. Region 3, Donald Stewart. The following are member deaths in Region 3 since the 2012 National Convention. Alabama, 500. Florida, 1,839. Georgia, 607. Mississippi, 182. Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, 64. South Carolina, 250. Total member deaths in Region 3, 3,442. Region 4, Paul Johnson. The following are deaths of Region 4 since the Convention 2012. Illinois, 643. Indiana, 341. Michigan, 492. Ohio, 766. Wisconsin, 356. Total deaths in Region 4, 12,000.
Region 6, Jerome Smith. Following are the number of deaths in the past two years from Region 6. Arkansas, 277. Louisiana, 291. Oklahoma, 400. And one, the Republic of Panama, 171, Texas, 1,124, the total member deaths in Region 6 in the past two years, 2,264. Region 7, Frank Impina. The following are member deaths in Region 7 since the 2012 National Convention. Arizona, 493. Colorado, 436. New Mexico, 202. Utah, 133. And Wyoming, 44. Total member deaths in Region 7 1,308. Region 8, Helen Sajak. The following are member deaths in Region 8 since the 2012 National Convention. California, 2,358. Guam, 11. Hawaii, 313, Nevada, 154, the Philippines, 61. Total member deaths in Region 8, 2,897. Region 9, Lanny Ross. The following are members' deaths within Region 9 since the 2012 National Convention. Alaska, 57. Idaho, 96. Montana, 108. Oregon, 338. Washington State, 712. The total member deaths in Region 9, 1,311. May they all rest in peace. Region 10, William Martin. The following are member deaths in Region 10 since the, since the 2012 National Convention. Kentucky, 270. North Carolina, 507. Tennessee, 343. Virginia, 1,192. West Virginia, 121. E Chapter, 2363, 157. Total member deaths in Region 10, 2,590. Again, may they all rest in peace.
The total number of deaths in all regions since the 2012 National Convention, 24,535 members. I will now ask Rebecca Silverstein of North Chapter 1224, the Strawberry Chapter, to sing the inspirational song, Golden Dream. concludes the NARF celebration of life. Thank you, Ken. That was very inspiring. Very beautiful music. We will, Elaine Hughes, National Secretary, will read any special communications that uh, we have received. It is my pleasure to read a message from Senator Bill Nelson. Dear friends, congratulations and welcome to Florida. You couldn't have chosen a more beautiful part of the country to gather for NARF's 33rd Biennial National Convention. I am pleased this day has arrived. I commend you for your role in helping to ensure the welfare of federal employees and their families 
and I applaud your tireless dedication to maintaining a strong and effective federal workforce. Your contributions is vital to our nation and makes a real difference in the lives of those you serve. Thank you for your hard work and personal dedication. I hope you enjoy your time in the great state of Florida. Sincerely, Bill Nelson. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, now we will move into the Alzheimer's Committee report. To give you the report is Jane Rogers, chairperson of the Alzheimer's Committee. Jane will also introduce the two Alzheimer's speakers. Hello, everyone. The National Alzheimer Committee wants to thank the volunteers that helped work at the raffle table yesterday and today in order to have the booth open. We needed volunteers and they came through for us. Thank you very much. I'd like to make some introductions. On stage, our guest here from the Alzheimer Association in Chicago, we have Danielle Engel. She's a senior. She's the senior associate director, Nationwide Strategic Gifts. We have Harry Johns. He He's the president and CEO uh, of the Alzheimer Association, and he'll be speaking to you a little later on. And we also have Amy Shives. And Amy is a national early stage advisor, and Amy will also be speaking to you. Let's welcome our guests. Your National Alzheimer Committee members are seated on the front row, so please stand as I introduce you, and if everyone would hold their applause until I have recognized each one. Absent is Dennis Gowron, He's from New York, uh, Region 1. He had a prior commitment. James Boyle from New Jersey. He's Region 2. Peggy Harrell from Alabama, Region 3. And I'm from Indiana, and I represent Region 4. Janice Newshafer from Kansas. Region 5, Helen Landry from Louisiana. Region 6, Merv Stuckey from Arizona. Region 7, absent is George Rajewski from Nevada. He's Region 8. Jen Boguslawski, she's from Idaho. Region 9, Clara Weston is from North Carolina. She is Region Region 10. I also want to introduce Tawanda, Tawanda Franklin, Executive Assistant to uh, President Bodwin for all of her help to us, and of course, President Bodwin, our Committee Oversight Officer for his support and his leadership in our committee work. I would like to review some highlights of our meeting. Danielle has reported the latest figure, and we will be getting updates Monday or Tuesday. But we now are at 
$23,888. We need $23,812 to meet our goal. This probably is the closest we have ever been to reaching our goal at any national convention. So donations will be accepted. <laughs> we all know that the work we are supporting not only touches the medical issues from genetics to the cost of health care, but also topics of family relations and what quality of life we ought to be able to expect as we grow older. Thank you for supporting the important NARF volunteer program. This morning, with the expert assistance of Dr. Dean Hartley, and he's a director of science initiative at the Alzheimer's Association. The committee voted on and funded three more research scientists in the total amount of $439,931. I will give you a review of these projects in my next uh, NARF magazine article. We now have funded a total of 63 since this program started in 1985. So we are very likely to reach our goal this month, next month, September, surely by September. So it's going to be early. We voted to reach 11 million by 214, and we're going to be a little early on that. We're very proud of all the support we get from you. So, the committee joins me in recommending to this gathered delegation of NARF members that we set a new national goal of 12 million by 2016. to take effect once we have reached the current goal. So, with your applause, may I now hear your agreement on that recommendation, please. Now my, may I hear from those that are not in agreement, thank you. I'll take that as an affirmative. <laughs> we are going to have, and have already started it, a 60-40 raffle. Ticket prices are one, a dollar for one ticket, five for six tickets, 10 for 15. The distribution will be 60% of that total will go to Alzheimer research. The 40% will be awarded as follows. 50% to the first place ticket holder, 30 to the second, 20 to the third. The winning ticket will be drawn at Thursday morning session. You do not have to be present to win. We will not be open Thursday morning, so make sure you have all your ticket stubs in the drum by 4.30 p.m. Wednesday. There will also be a donation box. 100% of those donations will go to NARF research. We do have promotional material on display at the tables. These are items that the Federation and chapters can order directly from the Alzheimer's Association. They are providing these 
for us at no charge. So do take advantage of this. Use them during your fundraising or recruiting events. It provides an opportunity to brag about what we are doing, which is great public relations. We have lots of supplies. Take them back. Now is the time to make some awards. I wish we could give all of you the recognition you deserve. But the Federation who contributed the most in terms of total dollars during the fiscal year is from Region 10, Virginia. <laughs> $75,349. Yes. Would the Virginia Federation President Richard Gingerelli and Donna Shackelford, the Federation Alzheimer Coordinator, please come forward? While well, they're coming up, you're a little fast for me. <laughs> okay, so I've got here, while they are coming up, let me tell you who the other top federations are. In second place was California Region 8 at $28,911. Third place was North Carolina, Region 10, at $23,253. Fourth place was Florida, Region 3, at $22,090. Fifth place was Kansas, Region 5, at $21,975. The National, the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Citation for Distinguished Service is awarded to the Virginia Federation in recognition of outstanding contributions to the NAR Alzheimer program in the amount of $75,349, the most dollars of all the Federation nationwide during the 213-214, signed by me and your national president, Joe Bodwin. Now for the per capita category. This year, the Federation who contributed the most in terms of per capita goes to Delaware, Region 2. <laughs> and, and that is, uh, their per capita was $11.65 with the Delaware Federation Vice President, Kathy Adams, please come forward. While Kathy's coming up, I got to hurry, here she comes. I would like to mention the rest of the top federations. Number two is South Dakota, Region 5, at $7.86. Number three was West Virginia, Region 10, at $7.80. Region four was Mississippi, or fourth is Mississippi, region three at $7.68. Number five was Iowa, region five at $6.48. The National Active and Retirement.
retired federal employee citation for distinguished service is awarded to the Delaware Federation in recognition of outstanding contributions to the NARB Alzheimer program in the amount of $11.65 per capita. That is the most per capita of all the 54 federation nationwide during 2013-14, signed by me and the national president, Joe Bowdoin. Also want to mention the NARF chapter 1270 Woodbridge, Virginia was the top chapter in the nation with $15,831 in donations. <laughs> In closing, I want to thank all of you for your donations and your support. There will be a cure one day, and I hope NARF members will never give up the battle until we have a victory. I would like to introduce our first speaker, it's Amy Shives, who was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease in 2011. Amy graduated from Western Washington University in 1979 with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in psychology. Amy went on to receive a master's in education with a concentration in student personnel administration. For over 25 years, she was a faculty member at the Spokane Community College where she worked as a school counselor. Amy is a member of the Alzheimer's Association Inland Northwest Chapter and serves on the Chapter Board as an Ambassador to U.S. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington State, as well as a Walk to End Alzheimer Committee member and a team captain. She's an active participant on the Washington State Policy Committee and has participated in numerous local media and speaking engagements. As a member of the Alzheimer Association 214 National Early Stage Advisory Group, Amy would like to reduce the stigma surrounding Alzheimer's and dispel the myths that the disease only impacts the elderly. Amy lives in Spokane with her spouse together they have two daughters. Please welcome Amy. Oh my goodness. Well, on a lighter note, I needed to say today that you folks surely can pick a nice place for a convention. <laughs> the gift shop here even has Mickey Mouses to bring to the grandkids, and you don't have to even go to Disney World. <laughs> My compliments to your planning committee. As you can see in the program, I am speaking to you before the President and CEO of the Alzheimer's Association, Mr. Harry Johns. I feel like the warm-up band. <laughs> I do have Alzheimer's disease, as that was stated, so I will be reading, you, reading to you tonight. Thank you so very much for inviting me here today. It is an honor and a privilege to speak to you about my experience living with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's has been part of my life since I was a young child. 
My mother began showing symptoms of the disease in her early 50s. As a family, we did not know uh, or understand why our mother's personality was changing, and we were left with many unanswered questions about the cause of her symptoms. My mother became isolated, angry, disinterested, and generally detached from her children. Growing up in a family with so much uncertainty and disconnection had a significant impact on my development. This was some 50 years ago when we knew even less about the disease than we do now. My mother was eventually placed in a care facility and after many years, my mother passed away and there was nothing left of the family assets. In my early 50s, I was a wife, a mother of two daughters, and a tenured faculty counselor with a master's degree. I was not prepared for Alzheimer's disease to come back into my life. I began to exhibit, exhibit noticeable symptoms at work. I struggled to remember pertinent information necessary to perform the duties of my job. I could not organize myself or my emotions well enough to function and I no longer trusted myself to carry out my responsibilities for the college. Colleagues became concerned and even approached my husband to try and address my obvious challenges at work. I endured a year-long series of testing and at the age of 53, I was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. The process was difficult and made even more challenging by the lack of support I received from the medical community I depended on to take my concerns seriously. The diagnosis came with no treatment to cure or slow the progression of the disease or any alternate outcome. Our lives changed dramatically. The two-income family that supported two children in college was gone. My husband became the sole supporter for our family and stress levels increased. My general health declined and my career ended long before any thought of retirement. <clears throat> my mind was failing and our plans for the future erased. What literally saved my soul was enrolling in several clinical studies at the University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Center. At UCSF, I received confirmation of my diagnosis with compassion and the invitation to participate in clinical studies. I gladly make the trip from Spokane to San Francisco and Berkeley to donate my time and experience with the hope that someday we will combat this disease. As a study participant, I have undergone MRI and PET scans, multiple spinal taps, and cognitive testing as well as genetic testing. I have been enrolled in a sleep study to compare sleep patterns of individuals with a diagnosis and those without. I am currently enrolled in a retinal imaging and eye movement study that may impact how Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed. I am also evaluated for changes in my social functioning and emotional assessments. I am proud to be involved in a study that has received front funding from the Alzheimer's Association, the world's largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research. The study, Amyloid Pet Imaging in Alzheimer's Disease, FTD, and PPA, seeks to determine if amyloid PET imaging with Pittsburgh compound B, say that again, <laughs> can improve diagnosis accuracy in discriminating between Alzheimer's disease and FTD. As a participant, I have received two PET scans after being injected with different radioactive markers to show the activity in the brain and the presence of amyloid and there is a really good story there about how that happened. <laughs> In addition to research funding, recruiting, and retaining trial participants, it is one of the greatest obstacles, obstacles to develop Alzheimer's treatments. 
I am happy to report that I can count myself among those participants, as well as my spouse, George, who has participated in a study evaluating individual differences in emotional test processing. All of my involvement in these studies culminates with the donation of my brain to UCSF upon my death. Through participation in these studies, my self-esteem has been restored, and I, empowered, I am empowered to focus on the goal of a world without Alzheimer's. We simply must continue to live this life with the cards we are dealt. The quote I often use to emphasize this point is, Barnes burned down, now I can see the moon. <laughs> this is especially true for me as I'm compelled to accept my diagnosis and embrace my connection to the Alzheimer's Association as my new vocation. In addition to my role as a national early stage advisor, I'm a board member for the Alzheimer's Association, an ambassador to the United States Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington State, as well as a Walk to End Alzheimer's Committee and team person. Where do we go from here? We must continue to invest in research to address the causes and possible solutions to this disease. Your support will help us achieve medical breakthroughs in Alzheimer's disease in the near future. Research allows those of us living with the disease to have a hope and future. It is all that is left to us. While there may, may be no sign of hope for recovery for me, we are charged with ensuring that our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, can live in a world free from Alzheimer's disease. In closing, I wish to simply say thank you for your dedication to raising needed funds for Alzheimer's disease. To date, NARF members have raised almost 11 million for Alzheimer's research. It is because of the commitment and support from organizations like NARF and people like you that future generations will one day only learn about Alzheimer's disease in the history books. Thank you. sit in the front row. Our next speaker is Harry Johns, the president and CEO of the Alzheimer Association. Since his arrival in 2005, thanks to the mobilization and important work of millions in the communities across America, as well as the dedicated staff, the association has changed the public discussion about Alzheimer's, raising the epidemic and its devastating human and economic consequences to significant new levels of recognition and support. Harry was appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in 2011 to serve as a member of the Advisory Council on Alzheimer Research, Care, and Services. Following the 213 G8 Summit, Dementia Summit, he was named to the World Dementia Council. He also served CEO of the Alzheimer Impact Movement on the Executive Committee of Research America. Prior to joining the Alzheimer's Association, he was one of the four members of the executive team of the American Cancer Society. Harry is a graduate of Eckerd College and Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Business. Ladies and gentlemen, here from Chicago, the president and CEO of the Alzheimer Association, Harry Johns. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you doing?
you doing? Great. It is a great pleasure to be with you folks. First, uh, I want to thank Amy uh, for her inspiration. And I, I want to thank Jane and the committee and Joe and, and all of you folks. Uh, all of you, like Amy, inspire me. Uh, what you have done, what you have accomplished uh, since the mid-80s, raising $11 million, invested directly in research that has helped to change the very knowledge about Alzheimer's disease, and as Jane said, will one day result in a cure as a result of your work. So thank you so much, first of all, for what you have done and what you continue to do. Uh, you are truly inspiring, not only to me, but to Danielle and all of our staff, uh, we think so highly of, of you and what you've done. Uh, I just want to talk to you for just a few minutes about things that are happening, uh, especially since the last time you were all together and I had the chance to speak to you, because much has occurred, uh, much that's positive that adds to the hope uh, that we all have to get to that cure, and uh, I will tell you right now that I know, I'm confident, it is not a question of if, it's only a question of when we'll achieve that. So let me just tell you about a few things that have happened cumulatively with the science and things that have happened more recently. First, what I want to tell you about, you, you probably know that the Alzheimer's Association hosts what is the largest research meeting in the world each summer. We just had that meeting, and one of the big findings that was released there was an indication that if, in fact, you get some exercise, manage your diet, that's the toughest one of this list, I'll tell you right now, that you get some exercise, manage your diet, stay socially engaged, and manage your heart disease risks, you can make a real difference in your cognitive capabilities. Now, that's the strongest science we've seen so far of that sort, that looks more like what we knew about cancer, what we know about heart disease, what we know about diabetes. So that's, those are important findings where you can make a difference for yourselves today. But let me talk some about the science that will ultimately lead to the kinds of treatments we need for Alzheimer's. You know, because of the kind of investments that you've made over the course of time, the, uh, working in a partnership with the Alzheimer's Association, uh, we have been a part of every major breakthrough that has occurred in Alzheimer's. And you may not know that while Alzheimer's discovered the disease more than 100 years ago, the research really didn't begin until right around 1980, not long before you started supporting the effort. So the science in Alzheimer's is relatively new and relatively young, if you will. So it's now accumulating to the point where we're learning much more in them the value of all of it together is going up fairly rapidly. Well, about 10 years ago, we invested in something uh, that a young researcher had, because we'll invest when no one else can or will in the cutting edge ideas that will be the things that will ultimately answer this. And with your help, we invested uh, in a researcher uh, who came up with the idea that you could see those, you've heard of the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's in the brain? Anybody heard of those? Yeah. Those are the things that happen, not unlike heart disease in the arteries. Uh, those plaques and tangles don't naturally show up on a PET scan, for example. This young researcher thought he could show them up, show up those plaques on a PET scan, and it could make a difference, not only ultimately to diagnose the disease, but to help to see if the treatments for the disease were working to develop better drugs. So what's happened as a result of that now is the science community, and we've invested in that multiple times in the last several years, the science community now has a consensus that we should intervene earlier with drug tests because we can now see, we now know, that those plaques the pathology of the disease show up before the symptoms, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years in advance of symptoms. That's a hugely important finding. 
and consensus to intervene earlier so that we can develop drugs at an earlier stage of the process. Now, I'm also proud to say that a part of the work of the Alzheimer's Association is also not only partnering with NARF in all the great things that you do and us working together on research, but it's also a partnership with many of your colleagues in uh, departments, agencies that some of you worked in and that your colleagues uh, are working in today. Uh, HHS at Health and Human Services, they are responsible for what is the plan that has been developed as a result of the association working with the Congress to get the National Alzheimer's Project Act passed. And I'm proud to say that as a result of that, and I'll add it, uh, Congressman Micah was talking about it is difficult to get the Congress to agree. I think that's right, right? <laughs> we got the National Alzheimer's Project Act passed unanimously in both houses, folks. Uh, as a result of the kind of support that people get grabbed, and that was a big advance. What's important now about that plan, the existence of the plan, has now also made it possible to set some targets, a 2025 target, that by 2025, the plan for America is that we have effective treatment and prevention for Alzheimer's. In the science sense, that is a short stretch, but that is a big, a big change to have that plan. Now, if we start to put these things together in the things that are unfolding, we've been able, as a result of the plan, to get new funding from the Congress, from the administration and from the Congress. First the administration, 50 million additional dollars, then 100 million last year from the Congress. No other disease at this point has gotten that kind of additional support. And that is as a result of members of Congress working together to make that happen. Now those are huge advances, and 100 million more in the upcoming budget if that occurs. We've got work to do. But I tie these together because since the science community believes now that we must intervene earlier, uh, it becomes important to be able to do drug trials that look more like prevention trials. Well, the FDA for a long time had taken the position that if in fact uh, a drug company could not show true cognitive improvement as a result of drug, then they probably wouldn't approve the new drug. But I'm proud to say that working closely with the FDA in our research roundtable where we bring in scientists from government and industry together with the FDA folks and, and other regulators, that the FDA has changed their mind about that as a result of this changing science. And they've stepped up, and I have to give them great credit for it because they've been criticized for it, with an inappropriate understanding of what they've done. They've stepped up to say that they will consider things like those scans. And you heard Amy say she'd gotten spinal taps. Things like those that they call biomarkers could be indicators of a drug being approvable. That's a big step for the FDA to do that, because if you put these things together now again, the science that says intervene earlier, that shows that you have the pathology before the symptoms, uh, this FDA approval to use those kinds of indicators to potentially approve a drug, new funding at the federal level, and the association has invested with, in partnership with the federal government, on several new prevention trials now as a result. Those prevention trials are very exciting because for the first time we have the potential to see if drugs can actually slow down or stop the progression of the disease before the symptoms occur. There are a lot of courageous people like Amy and others who are stepping up to participate in those trials and we believe that they can make a huge difference in a fairly short term. We'll know if those drugs are working relatively soon over the next few years, aiming us toward that 2025 goal or hopefully even sooner. It's a very exciting time for the research. At the, at the research meeting I mentioned to you just a few moments ago, we have several thousand researchers present and the one thing I can tell you beyond some of those specifics I've mentioned that have come out of the meeting is the mood of the research community. 
which is upbeat. Upbeat about how this information over these years now has accumulated. And while they don't know about your specific work, I do, and as a result of what you've done, that science is accumulating, and that research community is upbeat and excited about the potential of where this is going to go. So, I want to thank you again for everything that you've already done and what you've just agreed to continue to do. You know, folks, my mom had this disease. I know that many of you, because I've worked with the committee closely, and I've talked to many others of you, you have been touched directly by this disease as well. My mom has since passed away, and now yet another member of my family has the disease. To me, this is as personal as it is professional, and I know that's true for so many of you. What I will assure you, that just like what you have done since the mid-80s, the Alzheimer's Association will be relentless. We will not stop until we succeed. Thank you so much, folks, for everything you do. I look forward to continuing to work with you in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, we appreciate the opportunity to speak at the convention. Thank you. Jane whispered when she came in just a couple of minutes ago, she said, geez, if everybody here would give $20, we'd meet our goal of $11 million. What a thought. And it's tax deductible. So you might want to think about that. We have one more piece of business here, and I'd like to recognize the future of NARF committee members. They were appointed back in July of last year. They worked very diligently and hard, came to Washington, or came and met a couple times in Washington. Uh, they met electronically a number of times. You've seen their reports, I'm sure, because we mailed out the special edition of the Insider to all of the officers, and most of you are all officers. We've had it on the website, we've talked about it in various periodicals that we have, but I'd like to recognize the members for their work on the committee. So if you would start working your way up, Evelyn and Bill, and then we'll go alphabetically. Rodney and Bruce. And the, uh, the plaques that we have say the future of NARF Fawn Committee, Evelyn Kirby, co chair, and appreciation for your tireless effort, which paved the way for the future success of NARF. Hold your applause, we'll get them all lined up, then uh, you can give the applause. Bill? William Wild Bill? No, he didn't say Wild, he just said Bill. Shackelford, the co chair, and basically saying the same thing as we just said forever. I'll take Thank that. You. Rodney Adelman from Arizona, the, uh, in appreciation for your tireless efforts, which paved the way for the future success of NARC. Every one of them is going to say the same thing. I'm not going to say it anymore. <laughs> thank you. And we got Bruce Coleman. Bruce, thank you so much for being on the committee and the hard work you all have done. This does not look like old Bob. Maybe it does. Old Bob Davidson. <laughs> but old Bob couldn't make it, and he asked to go here. Come and receive this for Nick Ostergan. Thanks for Thank you. doing it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Hall. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What's Tip, Tip got? Yeah. 
One of the past popes resigned because he didn't have the strength to do the job. <laughs> Joe is leaving his throne because, quite frankly, he's done all he can for NARF, even though, by some accounts, it wasn't much. <laughs> There are those who have described Joe as having the legal mind of Perry Mason, the investigative skills of Columbo, the intelligence of Albert Einstein, and the boldness of Roseanne. <laughs> However, his critics viewed him just a little differently. They saw Joe as having the common sense of Homer Simpson, the personality of Archie Bunker, the success of Wiley Coyote, and the work ethic of Larry the Cable Guy. When I think of Joe, I'm reminded of the classic film The Wizard of Oz. And I see a little bit of Joe in each of the main characters. He's much like the Tin Man in the fact that he has no heart when it comes to dealing with those in Congress. I'm sure there have been times these past four years when Joe would think of himself as the Scarecrow and say to himself, I don't have the brains to know any better as to why I'm doing any of this. <laughs> and I'll bet this towering figure we call our leader has trouble now and then finding his courage when it comes to dealing with his beautiful bride, Jane. Believe it or not, he's even reminiscent of Dorothy, especially when he's at his desk wondering where to find all these new members for NARF. In the hallways of the headquarters, he could be heard singing, Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. However, after all is said and done, Joe is really the awe-inspiring wizard himself. And come to think of it, he looks a little bit like the character in the movie. And just like the wizard was trying to help everyone get what they wanted, Joe is always helping his fellow NARF members. As the wizard in the movie floated away in the air in his air balloon, Joe will soon be floating away as the wizard of NARF. Joe, as you know, when things go poorly, the leader takes all the blame. And when they go well, people tend to forget who's really in charge. I spent the Reno convention and this one poking a little fun at you, and it's been done with respectful humor. After all, this is the man that sent me a happy birthday email indicating that my parents must be very proud of me, <laughs> even though I was hatched. <laughs> the real truth is, I very much respect you, Joe. I appreciate your loyalty to NARF and all your efforts for the work that you do for the federal retiree. You have represented NARF like many of your predecessors, with dignity and a never-say-die attitude. You have set the bar high for those who will follow in your footsteps. If there's one thing I could say that sums up my feelings for, towards you, it would be that I can call you my friend. I deeply thank you for your efforts these past four years, especially during very trying times for NARF. You were always willing to fight the good fight, and NARF is better off because of those efforts. 
You're somewhat like George Bailey from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. You mean a great deal to a lot of lives, and things would have been dramatically different if you were not in the life of NARF. I can sum up your, your efforts in NARF by quoting another famous politician. For those whose cares have been your concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. I want to take this opportunity to offer my applause and I ask the Hall of Delegates to join me in a standing ovation to this man who has led us these past four years. out of character when we get serious for a little bit. Uh, it's going to be short. I do have some announcements uh, to make in front of the group, but I do want to acknowledge your Sergeant at Arms Committee, and most of them are here tonight, and would you please stand? This is a very hard-working committee, and I'm very proud of them. We are here as, as servants to you, as in customer service, and if there's anything you need, see one of them and they will be able to help you. If they can't, I will, and if I can't, then you don't get help. <laughs> now, keep in mind, we must follow the rules of the convention, meaning the Sergeant Arms Committee, and also the, the, uh, uh, the orders of my president. The first aid room, for any of those that aren't aware, is on the second floor in Salon 12, and they, it will be open the entire time that our convention is in, in session. And if we should have an emergency here within the convention hall, we have a system set up that we will, uh, I have radios and I'm in radio contact with the paramedics, and they will be down immediately after being notified that we do have an emergency. We also are the lost and found. Now, as many of you know from past history, our record is outstanding on getting the items that have been lost back to our, uh, uh, the people that have lost them. In, uh, in Sparks, 20 items were lost, 19 items were returned to their owners. I will be up here every day of the convention twice a day making announcements. So if you're tired of hearing me with, with me now, uh, too bad you're gonna hear more of me. <laughs> if you have any announcements that you want me to make to the delegates, either write them on a piece of paper or we have back at uh, the Sergeant Arms table in the northeast corner, uh, cards, fill them out and I will make the announcements. Be specific and please print. Do not write, because I can't read most of the writings. Again, our table is in the back if you need to, you need to see me. There are restrooms on each end of the, 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 the hall. And tomorrow, when you come into the, the convention, you must have your badge with, with your little ribbons and your cards. If you do not have those, you will not be allowed in. Room, doors, as you're looking at the convention hall from the outside, doors two, reading from left to right, doors two, four, and six will be the only doors that will be open for entrance. One, three, five, and seven will be locked. We'll be able to get out those doors in an emergency, but we will not be able to come into the convention hall. There also is and I require the, the cooperation of all the delegates, there is a $10 donation fee 
for any device that goes off during the convention. And it's up to you to point out that person and make sure they are recognized by the other delegates. <laughs> And it was not mentioned before, but the restaurant, not Red's, but the other two restaurants offer a 20% discount on your bill uh, in the, in the, because you're with the convention. All right, now I will start the announcements that have been given to me so far for this evening. The Ohio Federation will meet tonight at 8 p.m. in room 239 uh, on the second floor. From Elaine Hughes, our National Secretary, Elaine is having a reception for Elaine for President reception in Suite 956 between 6.30 and 8.30 tonight. The Texas delegation, please meet in the rear of the, of the room at the northeast corner, which is down by my, my, uh, my office, uh, at the close of business today. Region 2, you have a reception tomorrow, Monday, from 6 to 8 p.m., room 1056. The Georgia Federation, meeting 7 p.m. tonight, in this ballroom. So I guess you'll have to figure out where in this ballroom. They did not uh, tell me where. The Virginia Federation members, please meet 7 p.m. today in Salon 8 uh, on the second floor. Uh, that's from uh, the uh, uh, Vice President. From the Alabama Federation, all delegates, attendees from Alabama Federation meet in this ballroom in the area nearest the U.S. flag up front immediately following this session. Just a short meeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard that one before. One of my uh, uh, Sergeant at Arms, Malcolm and Katie, his wife, are celebrating today their 51st wedding anniversary. <laughs> Malcolm, where are you? There they are. Stand up. There you go. They're both standing up. Congratulations, Malcolm. I was married three times and divorced three times, and I never made 20 years total. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Outside our convention hall, we have the Alzheimer's table. We have the uh, NARF PAC table. Uh, so please make contributions to both of them, those worthy causes. And we also have a table for the NARF F-E-E-A Disaster Fund, which is a fund we have set up when there's disasters in the country and we help out our fellow uh, uh, retirees uh, with uh, uh, money to try to make up for some of their losses. They are having uh, a raffle and they have about 20, 20 to 25 uh, prizes that you can uh, put your raffle tickets in to try to win. Now tomorrow, they will be open 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So please give generously. It is a fundraiser uh, and the prizes are terrific. This concludes my presentation. Uh, I was saddened that I was not the keynote speaker, but that's okay uh, because they're, they're on and they're done with. You're going to hear more from me. So I thank you and let's have a great convention starting tomorrow. One last uh, reminder, and that is, as you leave on the table out there, you will find a copy of the bylaws committee report 
and the rules for the convention. So pick up your copies as you leave. I will see you all tomorrow morning. We'll stand in recess until 9 o'clock. Thank you.